Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Hey, made it. (laughs) It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Please join me in our call to worship this morning. Lord, open our hearts this morning to hear your words of compassion. Lord, open our spirits this morning to strengthen our faith. Lord, make us ready to serve. We are called here this morning to learn of Christ's healing love. Every day there are many ways in which we can offer help to others. Come, let us worship the one who prepares us for service. Please join me in our hymn of adoration, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Father, we come into your house this morning amidst a week of celebration, of joy, of struggle, of pain, of heartache, all that we come from, Lord. Help us to be able to tune that out and to open our hearts to you, to your healing touch in this hour, that we might be regenerated, rejuvenated, and ready to go forth to serve. All these things we ask in your Son's name as we pray together the prayer you taught your disciples to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our psalm for today is taken from Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. So Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. We come to a time of greeting one another and good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. morning. 
Our announcements this morning include a reminder to mark your calendar for October 20th and 27th from 12 to 5 for our craft fair. Uh, snack bar, baked goods, crafters, raffles, and more. And so we do need baked goods, we do need crafters, so if you know somebody who, who uh, does that kind of thing, let, let, let us know. Wanda. The posters, Carly was very gracious and delivered them to me this morning, but we need some people to hang them up or distribute them or put them anywhere you can think of where we might get some people to come and enjoy the craft fair. It is during the Warren walkabout time, so hopefully we can add to that whole excitement. Oh, and the other thing is Priscilla and I are looking for uh, metal uh, tape measures, the kind that builders use, that might have been damaged or aren't usable anymore, don't retract, we're going to take them apart and cut them up. So if you happen to have one, we're looking for the ones that are an inch wide. Okay. We also continue to collect items for the town's food pantry, St. Mary's of the Bay, and they especially need larger family size box cereals, canned meat, tuna, spaghetti sauce, oatmeal pasta, two pound size and side dishes, crackers, ritz, and saltines. Um, our daily bread new booklets are available in the North, on the Northex table. Uh, there is an ABCORI meeting here this coming Saturday from 9 to noon, um, just for planning purposes. And Walkabout Warren bands are going to play each Sunday in October on our lawn, so that's nice. Yes? I have, of course, another announcement, but I want to make sure I say a special thank you to um, both Lisa and Chuck, because they came yesterday, and, and Lindsay, and we helped take all of the stuff that was left over from the craft, from the yard sale, put it into a, the trailer and the truck, and part of the way. And that was a big job. Well, I work. I work. Thank you. Maybe make light work, right? Good. Deb? Yes. Um, I delivered the food. Um, to St. Mary's this week, and the face on the woman's, the smile on the woman's face when I delivered the food was just precious. She, wow. has, she has a hard time keeping, she has a special sh shelf for oversized family shelf. She can't keep it stocked. Mm -hmm. And she was so appreciative. I get it. I raised two sons. A box of cereal is one serving. Yep. And you know, yeah. And yeah. Morning, yeah. Slap, you know, yeah. It's, so if we could make that our mission to try to keep that shelf full and buy the big stuff, even if it's just one job, that's better than nothing. You know, it yeah. just help these families a lot. Thank you. You're making a difference. That's, that's, yep. that's what it's all about. Any other announcements? Okay. Now we come to a time of giving our gifts, and might we be in the spirit of giving for the Lord.
Heavenly Father, we raise these gifts to you. We ask your blessing on each giver, whether it be their time, their talents, their resources, all given for your glory to further your word in the world. All these things we ask in your son's name and all God's people said. Down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. If you can sit right over here. Sit over there, yeah. There we go. Look at that. I have a picture to show you today. Uh, do you know who that is? Winnie the Pooh? Winnie the Pooh, yeah. Winnie the Pooh and his friend. Who's the, what's his friend's name? Do you know? <laughs> Pig, piggy, piglet, is that piglet? Yeah, yeah. And, and the caption says they're walking in, in the other direction. A friend is one of the nicest things you can have and one of the best things you can be. Do you have friends? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hannah's my friend. Hannah's your friend? Yeah, you have a lot of friends in school? Well, my friend is Mia. Mia, yeah, Mia's your friend. And she's in kindergarten, too. Oh. And she's not in my classroom. She's in a different one. How is kindergarten? Good. You like it? And I'm in fifth grade. Oh, my gosh. Pray for something. How did that happen? We can pray for something. What would you like to pray for? Violet and Lucy. For what? Violet and Melody. Violet and, Violet and Melody. Melody. Are those the twins? Yeah. Yeah. They were born this week, right? Yeah. One was three pounds, three ounces, and one was four pounds, five ounces. And girls, Violet and Melody, I like those names. Those are cute. We can pray for them. Yep. Are they going to go home soon, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Good. Good. Were you excited when you heard about them being born? Yeah, and then they're okay. You went to their baby shower. You went to their baby shower? Yeah. Nice. We were both wearing the mask. They were both wearing, I was wearing a dress. You're wearing a dress. Oh, my goodness. We wow. both look like flowers. We both, because since it was nice. BC, I wanted to look like a flower. So I found, like, the color of the dress looks like a flower. Nice. So we'll pray for them today. So let, let's, let's pray now. Okay, ready? Yeah. Dear God, we ask you to look over Violet and Melody and make them strong and help their mom and help all those that support them so that they can get better and bigger and, and ready to serve you. Amen. Amen. So being a friend is important. I'm going to talk to the adults about that today. Sometimes people are different. Is, is it harder to be a friend to somebody who's different? Mm -hmm. no? If somebody were mean to you, would that be hard to be a friend to somebody who's mean? Sometimes if we're nice to people who are mean, it kind of messes them up a little bit. And they say, oh, how come they're being nice? I'm not being nice. And then sometimes they become nice, right? Sometimes if we do what we want them to do, they change. So Sometimes. But if they don't, we just try. We try to be their friend, right? Not always easy. But we can ask God to help us to be their friend. Yeah. Okay, Sunday school. Have a good time. You can tell me something, yep. Wow. Can I hear one more thing? Yeah. One day, me and my friend Mia, she wanted to run. So one day, Ruby didn't want to be a friend anymore. Oh, that was hard, huh? You try to get her to be your friend. Will you keep trying? Okay. One more, one more. When one day Mia, the one I was playing with, uh, her one of her other friends, was, and she did not play with me. Oh, that was hard. Maybe next time. You just want to tell me one more thing. Please join me in our hymn of worship, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
Our scripture reading is from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. Warning against partiality. My brothers and sisters, do not claim the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory while showing partiality. For a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here in a good place, please. While the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor person. It is not the rich who oppresses you. Is it not they who drag you into the courts? It is not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was involved, invoked over you. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law of transgressors, as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So Speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What is good, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Surely the faith cannot save it. If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is, good of, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. In this particular scripture in James, respecting people is of the utmost importance and also being careful to not show any partiality due to someone's situation in life and respect of a person in the New Testament phrase for undue and unfair uh, partiality. It was Paul's belief that the Gentile and the Jew stand under similar judgment in the sight of God and to accept people with favor but not so much favor that we treat them any differently than someone else because they may have influence or prestige or, or power or wealth. A great characteristic of God is complete impartiality. Fairness to all should be our, our ultimate mission. There's no room for snobbery within the church, and it was James' fear that snobbery may invade the church. He draws a picture of two people here for us where we can clearly see a distinct difference. They must both be treated equally and fairly, and it's obvious from this that social problems did exist within the early church. We didn't invent them ourselves. The church was the only place in the ancient world where social distinctions did not exist. All must be made to feel welcome and as though they measure up. In the presence of God, all people are one. If you pay special attention to the rich, you are torn between the standards of the world and the standards of God. And a person who cannot make up their mind would be guilty of making class distinctions which have no place in Christian fellowship. The church should be representatives and ambassadors for God. Therefore, all are welcome, no matter what their status in life. God, said Abraham Lincoln, who was one of my favorites, must love common people because he made so many of them. It was the common people who Jesus took his message to on the open roads, the hillsides, the seasides, and we need to take our lead from Christ and follow in his footsteps. He goes on to talk about loving our neighbor as ourselves, and James calls the, the great injunction to, to love our neighbor as ourselves as the royal law. James goes on to lay down a great principle about the law of God. To break any part of it, we become transgressors or sinners. 
As he comes to the end of this section, James reminds his readers of two great facts of Christian life. The Christian lives under the law of liberty. It's the law of liberty that they will be judged according to. What he means is this, unlike the Pharisee and the Orthodox Jew, the Christian is not a person whose life is governed by the external pressure of a whole series of rules and regulations that are impressed on him from the outside. But they are governed by an inner compulsion of love, to follow the right way, the way, the love of God and the love to others. Not because any external law compels them to do so, or because any punishment frightens them into doing so, but because the love of Christ is within their heart and making them want to do so. The Christian must ever remember that only they will show mercy. Only they who show mercy will find mercy. Mercy to a person who is like themselves to ask for forgiveness for their own sins. Blessed are the merciful, so they they shall obtain mercy, says in Matthew 5, 7. If you will forgive people their shortcomings, then your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Judge not, lest you be judged. You've heard that before, right? The fact that Christianity must be ethically demonstrated is it's a kind of an essential part of the Christian faith. Throughout the New Testament, we see this theme over and over again. And James finishes up with, faith without deeds is dead. If you come to church and you hear the word of the Lord and you contemplate how you will apply that to your life and then you do nothing, you are like what I call the frozen chosen. And none of us are called by God to fit that role. Instead, we're called called to be movers and shakers, allowing the word to transform our lives, working our best to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. That's what we're called to be. So how are you following this particular scripture in James. I, do you love your neighbor as yourself? Do you apply the word to your life? Do you allow it to change you? Think of that while we go through our guided imagery today.
Now we come to a time of sharing our joys and concerns, and I want to thank Kevin for providing me with a, a list of shut-ins that we can pray for today. And we think of uh, Lisa and, and Barbara. We also think of Colette and Kathy and, and Judy, who the, the stairs are difficulty for. Um, continue to pray for those folks. I don't know if you heard about that accident in New Bedford the other day, right at 140 and 195, a woman and her son were killed, and her other three children, I believe, were, were somewhere in the car and were also badly injured. So um, um, I don't know the name, but I, I know that it was this mother and son and, and three kids, and the car flipped over. I don't know if it hit the guardrail and flipped or, or what happened, but it, was a one, it appeared to be a one-car accident about 9.30 in the morning on Friday. So keep them family in your prayers. What's that? In New Bedford, uh, 195, right where 140 uh, south, at 140 south. It's a, it's a very, very sharp turn on, the, on those 140 exits, so. Oh yeah, there was a second one in Foxborough. I heard about that one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, traffic was backed up for hours. The one in New Bedford was a, a really long time. So it was, yeah. Um, Prayer for the people in Georgia. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yes. Oh, yes. There was something going on in Kentucky last night too. I didn't see the news, but I heard about some shooting of cars. And Regarding the human life is just yeah. 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 to a lot of people it's really hard. I have a very special prayer request today. A good friend of mine, one of you passed away at 63 years old. So the prayers to start for his soul. Prayers to Marilyn and his daughter and Dan that we go through this time without him. Because he was a he was a good guy, very respected in this town. See Marilyn his daughter is Marilyn. His wife is Marilyn and his daughter is with Dan. And he actually run ran the company that restored all these sash in this building. Wow. He was an artist. He was a great builder and a good friend. <coughs> yes, my celebration is the twins were born on Sunday last week. <coughs> they are doing very well, growing, getting bigger. The larger of the two is, is um, probably would be able to go home in a, in a fairly short amount of time. But they're going to keep them for a couple weeks until things get a little further along. But they've done very, very well. And the mother is home, able to go home. Um, so they're in good shape. And I thank you for all your prayers. No, they're not identical. They are, they're fraternal. <laughs> okay. Violet and Melody. Violet and Mel Melody. Melody. Uh, what are their relation? What are they doing? They're yeah, my, my nieces. Speaking of twins, uh, Miss Everly, my twin grand niece, she's still going through some trouble. Uh, they still know that she had a massive fluid in her head, and she was just recently diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Uh, so she's doing good. She's a strong, happy chick. She really is. She's such a humble guy. She's full of life. But just praise for her. She goes through this time. Concerns for family at this time of loss, and, and uh, but let's come to Almighty God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we lay our hearts before you. We think this day of Scott. We think of his wife Marilyn. We know you have called him home for for better things, but we ask for your prayers and, and consolation and comfort for those left behind. We look to you, Lord, and we're joyful at the birth of these 
two beautiful twins, and, and we ask your continued strength and guidance for them to be able to come home. We're thankful that mom is home and, and, and doing well. We also, Lord, bring all these shut-ins that we have at home that either listening or not listening. We think of Lisa and Bobber and Colette and Kathy and, and Judy and, and anyone else that we may have forgotten, Lord. We just look to you and we know that you are with them, that you are watching along with them, that you are listening, that you are very much a part of their lives, even though they're not physically in this space. We look to you, Lord, and we ask to continue prayers for Everly as, as the family continues to work through her physical issues and that you might be with them and strengthen them. We look to you, Lord, and we ask for prayers for people in Georgia and the devastation caused by the latest shooting and, and things in Kentucky and things around the world, Lord, where people just have no regard for human life. We look to you, Lord, and we raise concerns that up upon our hearts that we may not have mentioned, but you know even before we speak. We look to you, Lord, for we know that you are the great physician, you are the great healer, you are the great comforter, you are our loudest cheerleader, you are the source of strength, you are calm in the storm. We are so thankful and so grateful for the time we have with you. All these things we raise to your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. You join me in our hymn of petition, the summons, will you come and follow me?
Our scripture text is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. Jesus cures a deaf man. From there he set out and went to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syro Phoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the little children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. And when she went home, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears and spat and touched his tongue. Then looked up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephthatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Jesus was not in this area by mistake. Jesus is here trying to, to get a little much-needed, much-deserved downtime, and he didn't want anyone to know that he was there. But his reputation preceded him, and that comes not to be, to get that alone time. Jesus' healing power is, is, is a great need, and Jesus is not here mistakenly. We find him here on the heels of last week's message where he made a huge declaration and wipes out the distinction held forever between clean and unclean foods between clean and unclean things. You have to wonder whether Jesus is making a distinction between clean and unclean people. It could very well be that Jesus is implying here that the Gentiles are not unclean as they've always been thought to be. And they too have a significant place in the kingdom. Now this is huge to say the least and a complete turnaround from the status quo and the thoughts of many, many years of history for the Jews. Jesus came to this area to the north for a temporary escape. He was facing opposition from all sides. He had turned their world upside down with his statements about clean and unclean. And a long time before this, the scribes and the Pharisees had labeled him a sinner because he would not follow their rules and regulations. Herod thought of him as a threat for sure, and the people of Nazareth treated him with great disdain. There was going to come a time when the world would reach a, a pinnacle for sure, when, the time, when things would come to a head, but this was not the time for now. Before that happened, Jesus would seek some solace, some quiet seclusion, and out of that seclusion and withdrawal from the angry mobs would come the very foundation, the beginning of Gentile non-Jewish kingdom. You know, we really have the Jews to thank for it, for it was the rejection by the Jews that created opportunity for the Gentiles and the way to Christianity. It was the love of Jesus, not the might of his armies, that was paving the way and kind of laying the foundation here. And that's one of the most important takeaways. The setting of the story is very interesting. The background also makes the story a, an interesting ingredient to the ministry of Jesus. Just a bit of geography here because it kind of lends itself to to understanding the story. Tyre and Sidon were both sites, were both cities of Phoenicia. Okay, they're cities within Phoenicia, which was part of Syria. Phoenicia surrounded Galilee, and Tyre was 40 miles northwest west of Capernaum. So probably the distance from here to Fenway. The name Tyre, when translated, means the rock. And it was called this because of the the shore that lay, on the shore lay two great rocks that were joined by a 3,000 foot long ridge. It's a huge, huge ridge. And the ridge itself formed a natural breakwater which made Tyre one of the 
great natural harbors of the world from the very earliest of times. Now the rocks not only formed a breakwater, they also formed a kind of fortress, famous fortress. It was from this location that the first sailors that steered by the stars came from. And until men learned how to find their way by the stars, the ships kind of hugged the coast. Even though Tyre and Sidon were cities that were part of Syria, they were independent and they were very much rivals. They each had their own kings, their own coinage, and their own gods, and outwardly they looked to the sea, and inwardly they looked to Damascus. The ships of the sea and the caravans of many lands flowed into that area, and in the end, Sidon lost the rivalry and their greatness to Tyre. One of the biggest things about this piece of the story is that now, Jesus is now in Gentile territory, non-Jewish territory. Before we get into what happened with this woman, it's important to look at this woman who came to have her daughter healed and the many societal norms that she ignored to come into Jesus' presence there. The woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician heritage. Now this may not seem like a big deal to us, but in this day and age, this woman would have been considered impure, unclean, She's also a woman without a man to initiate the conversation with this strange man. A huge taboo. Thankfully, things have changed, yeah? Added on to that situation at hand, her daughter is possessed by some kind of a demon. And we don't have any real insight into the particulars of that demonic possession, but we know from history of others that people with this malady do not go to the front of the societal line or any kind of display for certain. We don't have those kind of folks over for supper, okay? Now this woman who was asking for help was asking for help for her daughter to be healed. And the whole talk of feeding the dogs, the bread for the children is alarming to us. And dogs in those days were not viewed as they are today. To the Greek, the word dog meant a shameless and presumptuous woman. Imagine, shameless and presumptuous woman, they called a dog. It was not a nice word to use, and a dog was not the well-loved companion that it is today. Then it was a symbol of dishonor, and it was used as a word of contempt for non-Jews often. And No matter how you look at it, the word dog was a definite insult. And Jesus isn't using it as such here. as He's using it as a, a little pet lap dog in people's houses. And Jesus kind of took the sting out of the word, and the tone of his voice is interpreted to have made all the difference in the world. Jesus said the children must be fed first. There is meat left for the household pets. Translated to mean that the Jews have the offer of the gospel first. The children are considered to be the Jews. But only the first offer. There are many other offers to come. This particular woman was, was a Greek, and she first noticed that Jesus was speaking with a smile. She knew that there was opportunity there, and in these times people didn't have forks or knives or napkins. They ate with their hands, okay? And they wiped their hands on these large pieces of bread that were on the table, and then they threw the bread on the floor where the household dogs ate it. So the woman said, I know that the children are, are fed first and Israel gets the first, but can't I, a non-Jew, get the scraps that have been thrown away? Jesus loved her spunk. She was not gonna take no for an answer, but persisted. She had the health of her ill daughter at home that weighed heavy upon her heart. Her faith had been tested here, and she had proven that her faith was real. Thus, her prayer was answered, and she stood symbolically here for the Gentiles of the world who were eager to share in the bread of heaven that the Jews took for granted and threw away. Once this situation is done, Jesus goes on, and he goes down to Tyre to the territory around the Sea of Galilee. This was an extensive journey that took about eight months, even though the stories are right together, and the trip might have been some of the calm prior to the storm. It gave Jesus time with the disciples before things reached a, a pivotal head. And Jesus definitely needed this time. We think it's true because in this time, they're able to put the pieces together. His disciples are able to finally figure things out. Peter himself, as is expressed in the very next chapter, realizes that Jesus is the Christ. So they had time to talk and time to learn. When Jesus got to the Galilee area, he came to the district of Decapolis, and they brought him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. 
Very much like the woman in the first healing, this man is also an outsider. He's very much removed by the world because of his inability and difficulty with communication. Jesus does not hesitate to, to respond to his desperate need, and it was thought that the man's deafness made his ability to speak compromised. It's a beautiful story, though, of the way that Jesus treated people. He separated the man from the crowd, and that was most tender of him, saving him any further embarrassment. Life had to be very difficult for this man, and Jesus was very thoughtful in his treatment of the situation. Jesus laid his hands on the man by putting his fingers in his ears and touching his tongue with spittle. Now, to us, it sounds a little gross, but in those days, spit had a very curative quality, and it healed people. Jesus looked up to heaven to show where the power to heal was coming from, and then spoke the word, and the man was healed. The entire story shows us the care with which Jesus took and the respect that he showed this man by sparing his feelings and treating him with such care and tenderness. When Jesus brought healing and salvation to people, he had, in reality, begun again the work of God when he first created the world, before people in sin spoiled things. Pain was apparent, and loss in people was apparent, and, and demonic possession was very, very real, and people struggled, and people had pain just like people have pain today. Pain was universal, and it's still universal. But through people, God's love is made manifest comes to fruition. And this brings us to the final point. God's love is available to all of us. If it's true that God's love is universal, it also means it's available to you, me, whoever we may be, whatever our background, regardless of what we may have done. I found a great illustration in my doctoral reading resources. I don't know if you know I've started my doctorate, so I have to do a lot of reading. Lots and lots of reading, 5,000 pages, and so of all different kinds of books. And so this one book I was particularly moved by, I found a great illustration in, in the reading. And in it, you can put yourself within the story, and it kind of really makes a lot of sense. The name of the book is called Making a Difference in Preaching by Hayden W. Robinson. My first section of my residency is on preaching in, in, in October. He had heard a man named Gordon McDonald give an illustration that he thought was masterful. And so did I, which is why I share and credit him with the information. McDonald was preaching on John the Baptist, and we've talked a lot about John the Baptist, and he presented an imaginative updating of John's ministry in a story that every listener can enter into. It went like this. Now picture yourself in the crowd. Okay, you're in the crowd by the, by the, by the, by the River Jordan, and several management types were at this River Jordan as the crowds came to John, and they decided... They need to get things a bit more organized. You know how management people can kind of be, right? So they set up tables and they begin to give out tags to those coming for repentance. And on the tag is written the person's name and their chief sin. So just keep that in mind. Your name and your chief sin, okay? Bob walks up to the table and the organizers write his name on his tag and they ask, what's your most awful sin, Bob? And Bob says, I stole money from my boss, he said. And the person at the table makes a marker and writes in bold letters, embezzler, and slaps it on Bob's chest. And the next person comes forward and he says, name? Mary, Mary, what is your most awful sin? And Mary says, I gossiped about some people. It wasn't very much, but he didn't like those people. And the organizers write, Mary, slanderer, and they put it on her chest. Another man walks up to the table and he says, Name George. George, what's your most awful sin? I've thought about how nice it would be to have my neighbor's Corvette. George, covered her on his chest. Another man approaches the table. What's your name? And he says, My name is Gordon. And what's your sin? I had an affair, he said. And the organizer writes on the tag, Gordon, adulterer, and slaps it on his chest. Soon Christ comes to be baptized. Okay, so we all got our tags on, right? Christ comes to be baptized, and he walks down the line of those waiting to be baptized, and he asks them for their sin tags. One by one, he takes those tags off the people, and he sticks it on his own body. 
And he goes to John and he's baptized and the river washes away the ink from every tag that he bears. Christ took on the weight of the sin and takes on the weight of your sin on your tag. You are not excluded, you are included. No matter what you have done, no matter where you have been, we are often our own worst enemies. Christ has already forgiven us. We need to forgive ourselves. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we lay our lives before you. We place our trust in your hands. Help us to really feel the warmth of your love and the vast expanse of your forgiveness. For while we were all sinners, Christ died for the forgiveness of each and every one of us. Amen. Please join me in our hymn of benediction, Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. rejuvenated. Your sin tag has been wiped clean. You're ready to begin again. Amen?